This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in everybody to this week's edition of Doc and Jock, a holiday edition. Can't wait to break it all down. Everything that happened in the world of Detroit sports with my guy Adam, the Jock Strozinski. Got to break down the Lions beatdown of the Denver Broncos. Thought it was a great game to be at. Something that the Lions and their fan base definitely needed. Not only just playing well, but beating the ass of the Denver Broncos. I think it let a lot of people kind of feel a sense of relief, especially after some uh, some a bad stretch of play. Got to talk about the notice that the Lions sent out to their fan base. Season ticket holders this week, not so happy. Especially, you know, probably combined with the fact that they're all spending a boatload of money on Christmas. Now they got the email regarding how much 2024 ticket prices are going to be. Oh my goodness. But uh, a lot of good stuff happening with the Lions. They're on the verge of the playoffs. At the time of this recording, the Lions are not yet in but basically winning you're in. That's about it. And and basically it's right now as we speak it's 99.9% that the Detroit Lions are going to be in the postseason. And with one win, one win against the Vikings this Sunday, you have a great opportunity to on Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, Christmas present to all of Metro Detroit. The Lions could win the division for the first time in 30 years. Even Amon Ross St. Brown was shocked. He's like 30 years. Oh, I didn't know the history. 30 years, the Lions have not hoisted a division title. So it's going to be a fun time because that was a fun game. I think that a lot of people that were there, those that took it in, I think needed that in a, in a bad way. A, a game in which you played well on both sides of the football and you dominated an opponent that has special meaning to Dan Campbell. And his messaging throughout the week was great. He was like, if we don't play good, we're going to get our ass beat. And in turn, the Lions understood the mission, which was, hey, let's get Dan Campbell a a victory over his mentor. And not only was it a convincing victory, both sides of the football played at a very, very high level. It was a convincing win, a statement win, and one that gave the Lions fans a lot of confidence heading into the final three games. Yeah, I think this was one of those games where it helped also calm down the fan base. Going into this game, after what we've seen the last couple weeks, fans were extremely on edge. Uh, calling for for the quarterback's head. Quarterback comes out, throws five touchdowns. Calling for the defensive coordinators. And what do they do? They come out and I think they hit Russell Wilson eight times, sacked him twice. Uh, defense was flying all over the place, making plays. This was one of those games where when it was all said and done, I looked at my fiance and I said, why can't they just do this every week? Why can't they play like this every single week? This team looks so hungry. They look so motivated. They look so driven. They did everything right. You you controlled the ball. You didn't turn it over. You took shots downfield. You got everybody involved, right? Laporta had a great game. J-Mo got some touches, made a spectacular play along the sideline. Uh, Gibbs looked special. Montgomery looked good. There was one time where I was a little bit upset when they were in the red zone. They got a little bit too cute for their own liking. But after that, it was all just just line up and do what we do best. And what is that? You line up, you run the ball down their throat, and, or, or you line up at a run, you, you line up and you show run, and the next thing you know, you, you throw a pass to the end zone, and it's a touchdown. They took advantage of every opportunity this week on offense. And defensively, it was like a light switch went off. It was like they 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 uncovered this old book of of defensive plays and they're like, hey, let's try plugging some of this stuff in. You mean we can bring a safety up and we can pressure the quarterback? Oh, you mean we can bring other guys up to the line of scrimmage or we can rotate guys from the from the outside to the inside and get pressure? We can do different stuff. It was like they had a completely different defensive scheme this week than they did the last couple of weeks. The only real concern I have with this is I'm wondering if on the defensive side if they maybe show too much of their hand. Because you've seen stuff this week that you haven't seen in weeks prior. And I'm nervous as we get into the playoff run, right? As, as we get into the stretch for, for we're building towards the playoffs. I'm wondering if maybe they show too much. Do you have any concerns that the defense and Aaron Glenn maybe show too much of their hand uh, in this game 
and that might have a bit of a negative effect down the stretch in these final three games and then in the playoff game. Yeah, no, I, I look at it from this perspective. And the Lions, what they're trying to do, and this is what's complicated, is every single week it's a new scheme. And every single week they put up new uh, opportunities for new guys to try things. Obviously this week, the reason why the Lions were able to dominate defensively is Russell Wilson is not like Lamar Jackson. If you if, if you... And basically football is a game of chess and you try to maximize your, what you do well and minimize what you don't do well. And, and obviously Aaron Glenn knows that if you send pressure at that rate against Lamar Jackson, you make two or three mistakes and you're looking at a 70-yard touchdown. So the Lions don't want that. Against the Broncos, I think I, I got crushed online because I made a statement and people didn't understand it. I, I, I do a weekly appearance on a local network and I said, they asked me about Russell Wilson. I said, well, he's a poor man's Jared Goff. Oh, I got crushed. What are you talking about? Russ is this and Russ is that. And you, you anybody can do it. You just sit on the couch and type. And I said, no. I said, this is why. And obviously what that means is based on the matchup that you had, obviously the Lions felt like pressuring Russell Wilson could get there based on the talent that they had. And they felt like that Russell Wilson was not going to be able to get to, yeah, he had a couple plays, but he wasn't going to be able to dominate the game and and react as much. The Lions can't blitz at that rate against um, every single team. Now, with James Houston coming back maybe and C.J. Gardner-Johnson coming back, then the game plan, I think, could be a little bit more like that. You can be more aggressive because you can marry the blitz and the and the coverage. But here's the thing, and this is where it's the delicate balance when you look at putting in the context of defenses. I'm more of the opinion. It's a different philosophy. It's not right. It's not wrong. I'm of the opinion you do what you do, and you just do it against every team. And if, if, if you are a good man team, you just play man and, and see what happens. What these NFL teams do is they're so intricate. They know all the plays. They try to match wits with opposing offensive coordinators. And they're like, okay, we see, okay, when they got the, this personnel, we got to match it with this and this and that. And that just gets sometimes, and Dan Campbell said it a lot of times in his media sessions, oh, sometimes we just put too much on their plate. We got to back off because there's so much thinking involved at each spot. A linebacker's got to remember what alignments look at what things and what areas he's got to be at in certain coverages. And if you're wrong, it's going to end up messing up the defense. So I'm of the opinion, I'm always of the opinion, do what you do well, but dumb it down a little bit because these guys got a lot on their plate. And I think it favors the offense in a lot of ways because so many things can be shown with motion. So many clues are given regarding what a defense is doing based on good pre-snap reads and motions, you can kind of know exactly what's going on. Goff goes into every single uh, huddle with two plays, three plays, and he, he can sense, okay, if there's a single high safety, I can do this. If there's an opportunity here to, to go there, they know that. And all these guys got to be on the same page, so it's not that easy to do. And to your point earlier, the reason why the Lions can't blow out every team is because they have, unfortunately, when you go up in the NFL, bro, look, one one play, someone rolls up on Jonah Jenks, uh, one Big 350-pound dude rolls up on Jonah Jackson's ankle. He's out. One play, boom, meniscus for Frank Ragnow. He has to miss a game, which is just legendary. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But injuries well, here's just my thing. mess up. Real quick, I'm not saying blow every team out. They just looked so efficient they were healthy. on both sides of the ball. They were healthy. They looked, they looked so competent. Yes. It was unreal. Even when even when they went three and out or even when, yes. when drives stalled, it was like they pressed all the right buttons. Yes. I'm not saying you have to blow a team out by, by 10, 20, 30 points. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying go out there and look competent look like a look like a dangerous football team i thought that was the word that described them best on saturday night they looked incredibly dangerous and they looked dangerous on both sides of the ball absolutely and and health ma mattered they're playing at home there's extra motivation they practice better sometimes because you recognize look man i'm looking at a tweet right now and it's crazy i'm gonna tag you in it it's hard to be up for 17 weeks each and every week. And remember, this football team only had four losses. So you recognize every there's some days you just wake up and you go through your week and you're playing the fucking Bears. You're just not going to be amped up for it. It's like, okay, we, we go through it. You're not just normally human behavior will dictate you're just not going to be as crisp. With all the factors that were involved, they know, shit, the boss, this is important. The boss is, the boss is definitely 
paying attention to this one because he's going up against Sean Payton, and they know we don't want to fuck around. We, we know that we're on the verge of the playoffs, and the team is good enough to kind of ramp it up. Even if it's just a 5% difference in a week of practice is all it takes to, to be that crisp and play at a high level. And then when you get things going, it's unbelievable. So that's where it is, is that I think the Lions do want to play well in December. They do want to play at a high level. They wanted to show what they could do for their for the big man, Dan Campbell. And prime time in front of the country, big opportunity. They heard the noise. They heard that, oh, my God, Jared Goff is the worst thing since sliced bread. Pr- bring in mm-hmm. Hendon Hooker. They, they heard all, and, and, and the Lions are actually more now openly, openly saying it. We hear the noise. We hear you guys. We cannot not hear it in this day and age. And they said, okay. And it's a football team that's prideful. And they're able, and, 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 and Dan Campbell said, and I believe it too, it's a game of mismatches. And the Lions had so many opportunities to match up well against the Broncos that it made for an easy prediction that the Lions were going to win. And I thought early, a good sign. And unfortunately for two guys, I just think that Tracy Walker and Jerry Jacobs, their role in the secondary has to be where it's at. Go back to special teams. I think the Lions are better with Vildor and Khalil Dorsey than they're going to be with Jerry Jacobs. And I think that if Atu Melifanwu is going to have more of an opportunity, even when Gardner Johnson comes back, and you make changes, that's another big sign. The defense made some changes that I think you can you can bank you can bank on moving forward. And I think that the hunger that they know of uh, getting one game closer to the playoffs really makes it a special situation. And that's what you get. That's what it, it, it is so great because if there's confidence, if they play like that, they're going to be a tough out when they get to the postseason. The question is, do you sense the tide now rising? Can will they sustain this moving forward? Because they're relatively healthy, I think. Uh, J-Mo and Derek Barnes were nicked up. I asked Dan Campbell. He said, no, nah, it shouldn't. You know, they're going to be sore, but they should be okay for this week. Do you see the, the tide rising continuously now based on what we saw? I think that's a great momentum builder to kick off uh, a four-game stretch by whooping the ass of the Broncos. Yeah, I think it's a huge boost to the confidence, right? Like, to be able to go out and, and play a team that was red hot coming in to see you. Look, the Denver Broncos were the talk of the NFL. Denver Broncos were basically in the position that you were in last year. They were coming into your house, and they were looking to knock you out. Instead, you body slammed them through four tables. It, it, it was unreal what you did to them. So I think you can build off of that, and I think you can carry that over into a game against a division rival you are going to go into their house, and you know you're basically playing for playoff positioning at this point. If you win this game, not only do you secure the division, you also secure your spot in the playoffs. And then what happens is the next two weeks, I think there's a, a, a bit of a, a game plan that is out on how to take on Dallas. When he and, is and there. It shown to you this past week by the Bills. Run the ball, play well with your offensive line, and apply pressure to the quarterback. What do the Lions do in this game? They ran the ball extremely well. Their offensive line was stout. They, they applied pressure to the quarterback. These are all things you can carry over. That Dallas game, which was earmarked a loss by just about everybody, now all of a sudden looks a little bit more winnable. And then you've got to take on Minnesota one more time. And when you go to play Minnesota that one last time, and it sounds like Dan Campbell has already said it, we're, we're, we're playing all the way to the end. We're not resting, guys. We're, we're, we're going out there and we're trying to, to secure the second or the first playoff spot, depending on what happens, they have they may have a shot at the first overall playoff spot. It, it's going to they're going to need some help for that, but they are looking to to definitely secure uh, a second a uh, second overall all spot in the in the NFC uh, playoffs. So I think this game right here is not so much momentum because I don't necessarily know if momentum carries over from game to game, but I think it's something that you can build off of, and I think that. You've now laid a foundation. You've laid you've laid a, a a game plan's groundwork in this game, and it will allow you to build off of it for the next couple of games as you progress through the season and you get to the playoffs. I think you can carry over a lot of what you did in this game and take it to Minnesota and then take it to Dallas and then come back home and beat Minnesota one more time. I think this team has the ability and is in position now, whereas I think it was last week we, we said – they could go two and two. I think now this team has has put down that framework where they could end up going four and zero in those final four games. And, and look, it, they're one and zero right now. There's three more to take care of. Next game is what matters most, and that next game uh, will be coming up against Minnesota this week. So I, I think you you see some 
cutthroat ability in this team. And I think it was it was no more evident than what took place on that fourth and two call with 226 left. They're on Denver's 10-yard line. They end up calling a timeout, and they leave the offense on the field. The next play was Sam Laporta's third touchdown, and they ended up going up by 25 points, which is unreal. Did you have a problem with this team showing that that killer instinct, the the ability to go for the jugular and knock you out? At, at, at that point, team is up by uh, 18 points. They don't need to do that. They can run the clock down. All they got to do is get the first down. They can kick a field goal if they want. Uh, Denver had no more timeouts. But this team said, you know what? Let's strike and let's strike hard. Let's strike quick and let's leave their dead bodies bleeding on the floor. And this team went for it and scored a TD. This is something that you haven't seen from this Detroit Lions team. Again, that foundation, that framework that they can carry over to the next couple of games, I think was established. That mentality was established with two minutes and 26 seconds left in this game from Denver's 10-yard line. Did you have an issue with them going for it and basically throwing the kill shot to knock uh, Denver completely out of this game and just kind of embarrass them? No, I had no problem at all. I thought that Dan Campbell knows that his guy would do it, so there's an opportunity that you recognize that you know somebody would do it. So I think that you think that when you're going up against somebody that you respect, you know that they would do the same thing to you. And I think the Lions were trying to do something really important, so I have no problem with them uh, go, going through going through that and really helping the offense. I think the Lions needed that confidence, don't you think? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's more showing this is the mentality we've got to carry. This is the mentality that we're going to need when we get into the playoffs. This is the problem that I think we've had, we as fans have had with the, with the Detroit Lions. There's a lot of times where they almost feel soft, right? They almost feel cuddly. They're, they're a cute team. They're a nice team. Nobody really takes them too serious. They don't, they don't get enough credibility because they're not a team that can bludgeon you like the 49ers. They're not a team that, that has this defense that necessarily strike, strikes fear in you. Uh, they're not a team that really does any one thing incredibly special. And they're not a team that has been in the position to basically deliver that knockout blow and then has gone ahead and done it. It's a lot of times they play with, with kick gloves. A lot of times they play incredibly nice. And they're like, okay, cool. We'll just down it. We'll run the clock out. No big deal. We don't have to worry about anything. We're up by a whole bunch. No, no, no. This, this to me, this play, this play was, was symbiotic of what they want this season to be and what this team can be. That was a kill shot. There's not many times in many games where you have the opportunity to basically put a bullet in your opponent, opponent's head and them for dead. This team took advantage of that. This team went out there, put the gun to Denver's head, and then they pulled the trigger and they said, look, we're not messing around. And I think it is, it is, a, it is a mentality shift. It's a mindset shift. This is a team that is, that is gearing up for what is on the horizon. This is no longer a team that is – is just kind of working towards what's going to happen next week. I think at this moment in time, this team is starting to ramp things up. This team is really starting to do some of their deeper installs. So when they get into the playoffs, they have these things at their disposal. They have the ability to run this play and execute it incredibly well, and they don't have to necessarily worry about turning the ball over, or they don't have to worry about putting themselves in a bit of a hole. I think right now this team is is operating on on another level, something that they haven't had to do yet. It, this is getting familiar with what is about to come in the next couple of weeks. And, and look, I love seeing it. I think it is awesome. I don't think it's disrespectful. I think if you look at Sean Payton, you look at what Sean Payton has has done over the over his career. I mean, this is a guy who in a Super Bowl came out at halftime and kicked an onside kick. He wasn't playing around. This is the ultimate trickster. This is a guy who will take advantage of you and he will hang points on you. You can look no further than when the Detroit Lions and the New Orleans Saints played in that playoff game years ago with Matt Stafford. They ended up I, I think they were leading like something like 36 to, to, to 10 at one point. And next thing you know, the final score was like 46 to 13. It, it, like he ended up going for kill shots. He didn't have to, but he did. And I think that's what this team is, is, is establishing right now. It's a mentality and it's a way to go after your opponents and take out your opponents. And I absolutely loved it. I thought it was, I thought it was incredibly impressive the way that the, the offense played. Um, I thought the way that the defense held up. I thought the way the defense got to Russell Wilson. Look, this is not the same Russell Wilson that we have seen for years and years and years. He's a step slower. 
The thing is, the guy still has this uncanny ability to escape the pocket and to to prolong plays. And when he can prolong those plays, he does crazy things, especially when he throws off that back foot and just kind of throws the ball up in the air, and it usually comes down in his receiver's hands. So I thought the way that the offense, the defense, and even special teams played was incredibly impressive. What what impressed you most, though, in this game? Because there was a whole lot to take out of it. The, was the, the offensive prowess of this team just being able to almost at will at times march down the field and put the ball in the end zone? Or was it the the unrelenting defense that, like I said, got to, to Russell Wilson eight times, was able to sack him, basically made his life a living hell? There was a hit from uh, uh, Melifonwu where – he came off, or maybe it was uh, Veldor, where he came off the edge and just smoked, smoked Wilson in the back. And you're just like, ooh, his back is going to be hurting for at least the next four days. It, it, it was, it, to me, it was all really impressive, but I want to know what specifically impressed you most. Yeah, obviously Jared Goff. I thought that he rebounded well. I thought that he distributed the football at a high level. And I thought that he had one of his best games. <clears throat> a certain writer predicted that he was going to have a good game and it kind of had the vibes of a bounce back game based on this kind of a vibe in the locker room and not more my sports knowledge more my psychology knowledge that look and sometimes in the game of high level chess everybody knew that the Broncos were not a good team in terms of run defense but what's more insulting when you know you can take somebody strength on strength so Dan Campbell's like you know what everybody knows we're going to run so let's pass to start the game. Let's do something a little different. Did it work? No. But eventually, when the run game did get eventually started with Gibbs and Montgomery and obviously Laporta in the pass game, once it got going, it opened everything up for Jared Goff to be able to be successful. And Jared Goff loves playing at Ford Field, so I don't give myself a lot of credit other than I had the guts to write it. But, you know, and the way I wrote it was I thought he was going to get four touchdowns because nobody in their right mind is going to predict him to have five. Yeah, the but then, five? just in the end, I just said, because obviously I can share with you how I wrote, I broke it down. I said, you know what? How many? What was his career high? It was five. I'm like, okay, eh, five is a little much. Let's try four. And then I just had a, a little line at the end, and I said, if everything goes exceptionally well, maybe he'll tie his his career high for five in a game, and he did it. And I just think that obviously Dan Campbell, what makes him special, what makes him important, is that he knows. Look, everyone's destroying Jared Goff nationally, coming off the heels of what else was great? Cam Newton trying to get himself over, telling oh everybody, God. telling that the world on his podcast and his platform that. Jared Goff's a game manager, and Cam Newton's wise. He knows that that's going to rile up Detroit. Everybody knows outside of the country that if you poke the bear with the Lions fans, they're going to talk. They're going to chirp. They're going to be like, oh, my God, what do you know? And Cam Newton, genius, uh, to get himself attention to do his thing. And so what does Dan Campbell do? Let me get my boy some run. And <laughs> great. Jared Goff, I thought, rebounded well, and that's what you want. Now, I think it's it, everything that's talked about him is fair. Any quarter, look, he's not mobile. It's not his fault. He's a six-five white dude, but he can throw the ball. He can be smart. He can. He's maximizing his talent. It's not his fault. He can't run. It's just not. So Brad Holmes knows it, and unfortunately, Jared Goff is not going to just will himself to you know uh, a team that's not playing well on the offensive line. It's just not going to happen. So and it doesn't look right too. It, it's not right when you're getting hit 15 times a game to blame the quarterback. It was the offensive line's fault. They know it. Everybody knows it. So I think the team rallied around Goff. They have his respect. He respects them. And I thought his performance, look, simple. It's a, it's an offensive league. Brad Holmes knows it. Dan Campbell knows it. The world knows it. We're going to try to outscore you. We're going to try to win 42-35. And we're going to try to hold on. And that's why he said, wear your diapers. Because we're, we're not the 85 Bears. We don't got they don't got the talent to do it, and they don't believe mm-hmm. in the, the to tr- they didn't try. They're added two 36 year olds in a way to try and improve the defense. So they don't believe that that's what they need to do. They need to say it's a football team that's predicated on their offense. So I do believe the talent's better, much more polished, much more high end, and the defense always gets the raw end of the deal. But that's the way the league goes. But because look at it, multiple guys with seven touchdowns. You got David Montgomery, Jameer Gibbs, who's emerging. Jamison now is just getting to that point where he can be trusted more. You're getting opportunities where you see this offense, if it revs up, 
it's special. And I'm very impressed with the offense. The defense just has to hold on, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the if the if the defense can play at a similar style and a similar play pace and a similar aggression level that they had that at this this past week, I think this defense could be a bit of a game changer for this team. But I think the offense has to operate at such a high level because it's got to it's got to compensate for whatever that defense might do. I think the offensive line is incredibly important. This was one of the first times in a long time we've got to see this offensive line as it was meant to be constructed. And you got to see what it could do. It helped keep the pocket clean for Jared Goff, who had a great day. It helped set up the run for for two running backs, whether it was Montgomery or Gibbs, those guys running out of the backfield just wore down Denver. That's going to be important when you go on the road to, to, to Minnesota, when you go on the road to play Dallas. That is going to be important. Those are going to be game setters and tone setters. And the thing that I hope happens the most is that Ben Johnson doesn't get discouraged early if the run is getting stopped or if the run isn't necessarily working the way he hopes it to work. It, just because you're not getting massive chunk plays, you're not breaking off big runs, do not get away from it. Your run game is what makes you special. Your run game is is the one thing that you tend to do really, really well because your run game is what sets up your pass game. And look, like you said, J-Mo's coming around, and he's getting worked into more offensive sets and more offensive plays. He's getting more touches with the ball, and he looks like he can flip the game. It, 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 it's coming. I don't know if it'll happen this year. I my, my guess is it will happen – late this season or it will happen in that playoff game where he's going to get the ball and he's going to turn something out of nothing into something and it's going to be awesome to watch. Again, Amon St. Brown, he is special. He is like he is the 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 mindset and the mentality of this team. That that chip on your shoulder, let's go to work, let's grind this out, let's just go win games. He he's just a football player. And then you add in uh, ancillary pieces. Cleef Raymond, Craig Reynolds, you add in these guys who can go out there and they're, they're pros. They make plays. They're not necessarily the guys who grab all the headlines, but they're guys who make plays and they show up and they do their job. This offense can operate at, a, at the highest of levels. I think that is what is needed and that is what is most important. I think that was what was most special to see this past week. And I think for a playoff run, that is what is going to be needed the most from this team. Going into the playoffs... Mm-hmm. Do you want to see the defense operating at a higher level or do you want to see the offense operating at a higher level? Oh, I love to see the defense really step it up. If they can just pressure the quarterback more, make more moves uh, in regards to, you know, James Houston coming back, the great news of C.J. Gardner-Johnson practicing this week. Don't expect him to play against the Vikings, but a good week of practice from him will will, will definitely improve things, the swagger. So you know, getting Lee McNeil back, I think the postseason, the Lions could be getting healthy at the right time. So I think the well, defense... The, the defense, I think, is it has an opportunity to raise their game even higher than I think the offense can because the offense, when it gets going, you've seen they've scored 35 points or more mm-hmm. in many games. I think the defense is the area that can improve the most in this team. Yeah, you can really ratchet up that defense and really make the life of your opponents really, really difficult. Speaking of playoffs, who do you want to see in the playoffs? I mean, you are going to have uh, uh, kind of a Ferris wheel of of teams that you can kind of pick from. You've got Minnesota, you got Green Bay. You're, you're going to see both of them before you get to the playoffs. You've got New Orleans. You've already played them. Uh, you've played Atlanta last year. Uh, they don't really look like they're all that special. You've got the Rams. There's an interesting storyline there with Matt Stafford and just the Rams organization with this front office. And then you've got Seattle, who seems to kind of have that magic elixir uh, of coming into your house and, and stomping your dreams. Who would you like to see uh, in the first round of the playoffs? Because the dream scenario for the podcast, the website, it would have to be the Rams. I mean, literally full circle, the intertwining of the organizations with Brad Holmes coming from the Rams, the trade, the, the narrative of Jared Goff trying to prove that his former coach, Sean McVay, uh, in the trade that made everybody think that uh, Goff was a throwaway or an add-in or, or somebody that wasn't that was less than. So I think that the stories are crazy and I want to see it. I want to see, and I'm going to keep saying it. I want to see the lions with the lead four points, five points, six points, Matthew Stafford with two minutes on the clock gets the football. What happens? Oh, you know, does he come back and actually get the playoff victory? Do the lions make the play? But here's, here's also my confidence level. One, we get the, the, all the storylines, all the good juice, all the good information. And I think Matthew Stafford is similar 
to Russell Wilson in that you can pressure Stafford. You can dial up the blitzes. Hutchinson can sack Stafford. He's he's at more athletic, but he's not going to wow you with his speed. So I could see an opportunity where it might be tight early, but the Lions would win the game. I would have no doubt the Lions would win that contest. Um, yeah, there's obviously the chance the Lions could crap the bed and things like that, but it, it goes to show you the home crowd, the passion. Hopefully it's maybe a night game where golf shines, but I think that the Lions have a lot more weapons than the Rams do, and I think the Rams' defense is not as good. And we get all the stories, and then you get the win. Seahawks scare me. You know, Drew Locke, maybe he unlocks something. You never know off a crazy win off of what he did against the Eagles on Monday night. You never know, you know, what that means if Geno Smith, you know, comes back more competitive, more hungry. I'm just scared of Pete Carroll. I think he knows, and obviously earlier this year, I don't think the Lions defense matches. You don't, I don't want to see Seattle in the first round. That'd be a nightmare. So that's who I want to see. I want to see the Rams. Storylines, baby. I See, I, I, I'm, I'm different. I, I don't want to see the Rams. I don't want to hear the Matt, the Matt Stafford story. Uh, I don't want to see Sean McVay's face. Uh, look, I, I think the Rams are, are an interesting team. I also think the Rams could be a deadly team. Uh, that offense is, is still pretty potent. Uh, Puga Nakua is, is, is a stud. You got Cooper Cup. Uh, Kyron Williams is the real deal. So that that offense just kind of scares me. And look, Lions defense. Uh, even though we needed to ratchet up and had a really good game against Denver, I don't I don't necessarily believe in it uh, with my whole heart. So I do not want to see the Rams. Uh, I look. I th- I would love to see Minnesota, who's operating with what feels like their 17th quarterback. Uh, I'd love to see Green Bay get some revenge for what took place on Thanksgiving. Uh, I would like to see New Orleans because I feel like that is a, a team that is built like a house of cards. I think Atlanta is interesting because there's a lot of there's a lot that kind of surrounds the uh, B. John Robinson and, and, and Arthur Smith and and just there there there's just an interesting story there. Like the fact that Arthur Smith is probably going to survive this season is is incredibly fascinating to me, and I feel like there there are storylines there that are just a little bit more intriguing to me, and then. I would love to play Seattle. I'd love to be able to get some revenge on Seattle and, and just prove that Pete Carroll doesn't have the magic elixir to pop Detroit every time he gets to play them. Uh, if I had to pick one team, though, if I had to pick one team to play, it's going to be Minnesota. Without even us facing them yet, I would love to face Minnesota, and, and I think it makes for an interesting dynamic. This would be you playing a team three times in approximately four weeks that's a lot. At that point, you have such intimate knowledge of each other. And at that point, I think it's just talent takes over. Whoever has the best talent is going to win that game. And I think Detroit is a more talented team than the Minnesota Vikings. And, and I think that would that would help them get to that next level where they can play that second playoff game, whether it be at home or whether it be on the road. Uh, we can then sit there and let the cards kind of fall where they fall. But I would love to see Minnesota. I think it would be an interesting story. Like I said, playing the same team over and over and over again over the course of four weeks is is just something you don't usually get to see. It, it doesn't happen a ton. I think Minnesota would be would be very, very interesting. Very interesting. Are you confident we'll get the win? I think this is the year, because I think this is the year where the stars are aligning. As long as you stay healthy, you still got three games. Like you said, they can if they win out, they have a real strong chance to be the number two seed. Yeah, number one's unlikely, but... Because not just one, maybe two home playoff games. Yeah, I look, I, I, after this past game, I feel there's like this renewed sense of hope, right? I feel more confident in this team and in the ability of this coaching staff to put these guys in positions to, to win games. If you look at what Denver did well, right? If you look at what they, what they do on the offensive side of the ball, because look, I feel like Detroit's offense is is fine. I don't necessarily think we need to worry about it. As long as Jared Goff isn't spilling the pill or he's not throwing to the other team, this this offense is going to put points on the board. This offense is good enough to to take advantage of of whatever they're given. All right? It's just keeping the ball out of the other team's hands when you have it. I, I think the big concern for this team is defensively. You look at what Denver does well, right? Again, we talked about their quarterback. Quarterback was red hot coming into this game. You look at their their offense. 
they have some pretty elite wide receivers. Jerry Judy's a very good wide receiver. Cortland Sutton's a very good wide receiver. Uh, they've got a, a bit of a two-headed monster at running back. It, to me, it doesn't really feel like it had the ability to really get going this year, um, whether it's just a different you know, play scheme and they're just not used to it or, or what. Uh, you've got guys who are, who are very good at that running back position. So to me, you were able to, to basically bottle that up you were able to maintain it, and you were able to muck up those wide receivers and those running backs, and you were able to get to the quarterback. So for me, I think that bodes well going forward. You can carry that over. That type of play carries with you. You can go on the road, and you can do those things. You you you, you don't need to be at home for that. So I think it's interesting because I, I think whomever they face, whomever they face, I think they get that first win uh, at home. And then if they're going to go on the road or if they're going to stay at home, I think they have a really good chance to get that second win. And, and look, I might be living a little high off the hog because of what we just seen, but I, I think they are in a really good position where they can take advantage of, of whatever is to come, uh, for them going forward. So I am, I'm extremely excited about this March to the playoffs with, with the lions, but the March kind of starts, this week starts on Christmas Eve. What is the one thing that people should be paying attention to in this game? Definitely, you want to pay attention to Justin Jefferson. If you don't play well on him, he's known to be able to play well uh, against Detroit. And I feel bad for Cam Sutton. I feel bad for the defense because the opportunity in regards to a guy that, even though it's Nick Mullins, the quarterback, I still think Justin Jefferson is going to be hungry. He's going to have an opportunity to kind of continue his his uh, comeback from injuries and stuff like that. And the Vikings are hungry. They got that desperation going on because th- their season's still alive. I just don't think they got the weapons and the tools to do it, but I'm very, very fascinated with how the Vikings play. I, I, I think they split. I think maybe this game might be a loss, but the Lions still get into the postseason in regards to um, you know others losing and things like that. All you need is the Rams or things like that. So... I'm confident the Lions will be in the postseason. I'm not sure yet they'll clinch the division. It's kind of one of those situations in which, you know, the Vikings could pull it out and play their best game, everything kind of similar to how the Lions played. And then the Lions will be ramped up for Dallas in front of uh, in front of a national audience. I think a big audience would definitely tuning in for that because that game will be for the number two seed. But I do think the Lions are they're, they're better team. If they play better, there's no reason why they can't win. It's just you know, desperate, hungry football teams you're always nervous about. And when there's one guy that's head and tails above everybody else, he single-handedly can just, one guy can impact the game in so many ways. But if the Lions play well, they play clean, and Jared Goff doesn't turn it over, it'll be a W. But number one thing is, the Lions said it, play clean. Don't turn over, get one, get one turnover, and play your game. You have an opportunity to get the win. And I think the hunger for the Lions to get the division should be super strong, especially if Dan Campbell's been harping on it for so long. Yeah, look, I think uh, I think they get the win this week, and I think the one thing to to look for in this game is how the Minnesota defensive line goes up against the the Detroit offensive line. If the Detroit offensive line can can withstand that Minnesota defense, the Minnesota defense is very very good. I, I think that is that is going to be the tipping point in this game. If the offensive line can hold up to what that defensive front can bring. It's going to allow Jared, Jared Goff to have a clean pocket. He's going to be able to pass the ball. It's going to allow that run game to get going. We just talked about how that run game can kind of establish the tone and, and set the day for this team. So I think that is where this game is won and lost. And I think that the the offensive line, getting healthier, going into the playoffs, uh, coming off of a, a really important game last week, I think – getting an extra day of rest. I think all of this plays a factor and all of this helps this team. I think that they go to Minnesota. I think they clinch that playoff spot. I think they clinch the division. I think they get a big win. I think it's going to be a bit of a, of a tough game. The, the lions end up winning uh, 27 to 24. I think Jeff- Justin Jefferson is going to have a bit of a day. He's a little bit banged up, but he is still such a lethal Lethal weapon. On top of that, Jordan Addison is a stud uh, playing opposite of him. So I think both of those guys will have decent days. Nick Mullins is Nick Mullins. It, it's going to be what it is. I don't think he's anything special. He's a guy who can kind of get the job done. Uh, we'll see what happens, though. But I think Minnesota's strength is their defense, specifically their defensive front. And I think that 
uh, Detroit it, getting healthy this late in the season. I think it's important. I, I think we tend to underestimate that. And we, we, we tend to undersell that. Getting healthy at this late in the season and getting to see this unit play as it was originally intended is a big deal for this team. And I think it speaks volumes for how they play. And I think it will be a bit of a game changer in this game. And I think they get the dub. Yeah. Don't, uh, you, you said earlier you're excited. Taper your excitement because the more that the Lions hear you're excited, the more they're going to raise the price on you. Oh, my yeah. God. It, <laughs> it was wild because it was very wild. It was just a random Monday. You're going through the review of the game, watching tape, seeing the national reaction. All of a sudden, the, the tweets start flying. Oh, my God. My tickets doubled. What the F? Are you kidding? Double? And then some people were like, double? I got 80%. And the, those that, that got the ticket prices in the 80% were in the upper bowl. But, you know, in context, the Lions were far below the league average because the league average is way too high. 250 bucks floor? Really, the average ticket price now for the NFL is near 300 bucks. And I just posted a photo at Detroit Podcast when me and Kenny were season ticket holders because the ticket was 50 bucks 20 years ago. 50 bucks, 57 bucks. And, and, and for us, it just kept, it, it, for us, the reason why we stopped was the losing was horrible. We loved the tailgate. We loved it. We'd get in the stadium and it'd be a complete joke. It'd be a shit show. We, I think me and Kenny maybe saw two, three wins in four years being season ticket holders. And Kenny tapped out. He's like, John, I just can't do it. I can't justify it. Because it started off at like 50, went to 53, 55, 57. And then it just kept going up. It was going to be 65 to 70. And you're like, oh, man, this is going to be like rent. They're going to keep tapping your ass. And... Unfortunately, here's the crazy part. The timing, one thing is crazy. And two, they're asking for a big investment without fully seeing the result. And here's an analogy. It's like a, a terrible Middle Eastern restaurant that gets shut down and a new owner comes in, names it hummus, opens it uh, for a taste test and serves appetizers and is like, all right, I, this looks good. I'm going to charge you full price for everything. And you're like, wait a minute. I want to see the, the chicken shawarma. I want to see the... The Baba Ganoush, I want to see the Fatouche, I want to see what the heck is going on, I want to see more. And they're like, no, we're just going to give you this and we're going to charge you an entry fee to come here. And you're like, wait a minute, I haven't seen it all yet. You give me a little taste, a little sample, what are you talking about? And that's what the Lions have done. They've just given a little sample. They had one good year, one, and they haven't even gotten the playoff win yet. I think they could. I think the Lions could have took a gamble and said, wait, let's wait until they won the playoff game, then send it out. Dude, they're collecting now, and they're, they they got the fans right at the height of satisfaction. They're like, ooh, they're ramped up. They got a big win. Let's charge them a shitload of money. And cuz, it's not right. It's a lot. I know it's a business, but I think it should have just been steady, 20%. I, I would have just did 20% raise across the board and just do it over a period of time. And Dan Campbell's good for it. I just thought, man, that that's tough. I, I think, unfortunately— when they saw that there's 7,000 people on the waiting list, you saw that the ticket demand's high. It's unfortunate, but you're going to lose a, probably a good couple thousand fans that can't pay that. It's, it's high. And to me, it's not enough. It's not a knock, but $300. Listen, I'll be honest. I got into the media to go watch the Lions game for free. That's I'm being straight up honest. I mean, I'm a big fan. I'm a big supporter. I cover the team. And I, there's no way in hell, me. you know what I mean? The Lions took couple grand from me, and I made it back in spades. But to be honest, I could not justify paying five grand to the Lions every single year. It's crazy. I think it's wrong. It's not worth it compared to the home experience when I watch home games at home and you go to your own bathroom. It's crowded. It's, it's, it's fun to cheer. And the way in which I would do it, guys, I think the smartest way is if you're just a regular individual, pick one game that you just think you, you want to spend on Spend the money on one game and enjoy the rest. Or buy the tickets and sell off. You know, next year would be a good investment because they're going to have a primetime game, maybe a big game. And I, I would, uh, a lot of first place teams, I would um, look to sell some. But I just think the season ticket situation is crazy. Um, I've been blessed, obviously, doing the podcast, growing something where I can go for free. I can't, I can't justify paying $400 a ticket for. 27th and, and, and up row seats. That's crazy, cuz. Look, did you see the playoff tickets? $600 minimum. Yeah. It, it, it's nuts. It, this is the thing. I, I think this speaks to an organization as much good as they have done, right? 
as much good as, as Sheila Ford Hamp has done coming in and, and adjusting the culture and doing what she's done to, to make this a winning product. I think this screams of a organization of a team that is not used to being in this position. It, it screams of a team that is looking to take advantage and strike while the iron is hot. To me, it tells you that the organization doesn't necessarily believe that this is something that that can be built upon, something that can be extended. And, and not so much an organization like Brad Holmes or, or Dan Campbell, because I think they believe in what they're doing. I think from the business side of it, I don't think that the 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 Rod Woods, the, the 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 financial people necessarily have the belief that this is something that can be duplicated. And look, next year is going to be harder. There's there's a good possibility that that this team could go uh, 13 and four this season. If everything falls right, this team could go 13 and four. All right, uh, more likely than not, uh, this team probably goes 12 and five or or 11 and six. Still very very good. Next year, it's going to be really, really difficult to duplicate that because you're playing a much tougher schedule. You're playing a lot of of uh, first place teams, uh, teams that were in first place this year. You're going to be playing a lot of them next year. Uh, your your AFC team, your AFC division is going to change. There's going to be a lot of changing that goes on with who you're playing and who you're taking on. So, I think the the financial people don't necessarily have the full belief that this is going to be able to be duplicated, which is really unfortunate. So you're kind of, you're kind of gouging your loyal fan base, which I feel like is, is just complete and utter shit. It's just a garbage business move. Uh, I very much like you. I, I agree. If you want to raise it, I get it right. Like makes sense. This is a team that is in the bottom third of the league. As far as ticket prices go, this is a, a team that over the course of, years and decades has underwhelmed with a bad product on the field. So they haven't had the ability to charge uh, what a team like Kansas city charges, Kansas city's tickets. I think that just to get in the door, their average ticket price is like 600 bucks. The, the Detroit lions are nowhere near that. I think you can get at this moment in time, you can get in the door for somewhere right around 70. So it's like, you know, eight, nine times less. But this to me feels like a, a, a rash move to try to take advantage of the success. You came off of a, a pretty successful year uh, last year. You've built on it this year, and you're trying to to jump ahead of that curve and, and take advantage of whatever you can take advantage of for the following year. I think it's bad. I think if you were going to increase rates, again, similar to what you said, you you do it in, in, in increments. Uh, you do it a little bit smaller. You don't just go and, 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 and strike while the iron is hot. And the bad thing is, they basically do it while the Lions are in this euphoria after a massive win uh, over over Denver. It doesn't really let them. Doesn't really give it time to kind of set in. Uh, it doesn't really feel right. It feels like, hey, guess what? We just won and we're going to continue to win. So give us your money. And it just it feels like a, a really shitty business principle. I, I don't really like it. It's it's a little bit unfortunate. Well, unfortunately, you know it. Uh, you've experienced it. I've experienced it uh, working in an office. Uh, it, it, I always share this uh, with my clients, and it's a funny story. So obviously, when you rent an office, every single year the rent goes up. So I figured, okay, you know, I'm Middle Eastern, maybe I'll do some negotiating. So after my first three, four-year uh, thing, I said, look, I'm going to stay here. I'm pretty solvent. I can do this, and I want to stay here. I do a couple things out of the office. I'm very comfortable here. I want to stay here. Look, uh, I know you want me to st- You guys do three years with a fourth-year option. Can I do, like, five-year option? Uh, or, or can I do six years, seven years, and you guys lower the amount that you go up? And I sent it. I'm like, I'm confident. I'm like, that makes sense. I commit more years, and they'll lower the price. I felt good. I felt it was well reasoned. Uh, da da da. Four minutes later, they sent it a reply. It was hilarious, and I got my first lesson in in business. They said, and, and I got my first lesson in supply and demand at 35 years old. They're like, Mr. Macaroon, um, we kindly regret to inform you that we cannot uh, accommodate your request. Um, the, the, uh, the lease agreement that we've sent you is the final offer. And, and, and it was nice. Obviously they said it that way. And they said, look, to be honest with you, it's market rate. Uh, this is the, the market price. And, and they said directly, if you were to leave, we would have five people to replace you. So if you want to sign it, sign it. No problem. If you don't, no problem. It was, you're a great tenant. And I was like, damn. So every hmm. year, five, uh, five, 6% increase in, 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 in rent. 
And, and, and in learning the real estate business, because I'm very curious and you, you, know, you know people that do this, it, it's a staple. If you own property, you own an apartment, every year you raise the rent, no matter what. Cost of living, this and that, family problems, da 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 raise the rent. da 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 you know, hardship, person has disability, kids with disability, da, da, raise the rent, raise the rent, raise the rent. And it's, it's a staple. And unfortunately, you, you do know the owners obviously meet. They just had it like a one-day summit. They talk about these things. These are 32 billionaires who run a business, and they don't become billionaires by being nice to the middle class and the lower. They, they, they're nice. They're, they're, they're friendly. But again, the staple of business is profit, and the staple of business is raise the rent, raise the ticket prices. It's how you raise the value of your team. It's how you get more money. And it's how you operate things more. It's how you, you know, it's how you get taxed. And, and now, now us being in our 40s, we're starting to see, holy shit, because when I was 50 bucks, when you're making 25 grand a year is a lot. Could mm-hmm. you imagine paying $600 a ticket when you're making still the same 70 grand a year? It, 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 the cost is too much. They've priced out the average guy, the average Joe. You and I are average Joes. We've seen the hardships. We've seen what we've gone through. We've seen what our parents have gone through. It, we, we look at value. And you look at it, it's like, damn, can there be a $25 section like it used to be at Ford Field? Can there be, uh, can there be a section for the average Joe? It's tough because in the resale market, the average Joe now is down the ticket for 100 bucks. So it's crazy. I, don't, I, I, I get it. It's what you do it, but I would not take part. I just don't think, you know, Ford Field's nice because it, it's crazy too. Ford Field is nice, but it's not so fi nice. Like, do you see the pictures of SoFi Stadium and Jerry World? It's got bells and whistles. It's got things that fly, you know, are, it's got shit. It's got cool shit. Maybe you could pay 200 bucks to go to a game. Ford Field, man, you, you go to a wrestling event, you can hug you, me, you, Kenny, are all bunched up trying to get a beer, you know, right up on top of each other, you know, to junk to junk. It's like, damn, man, it's not, it, they didn't build it wide enough for the, the clientele who... There's a lot of fat ass Lions fans who walk around that place and they they rub up on you. When it gets packed, you can't move. So going to Metallica concert, I was like, damn, I'm I'm like brushing up on everybody's everybody's shit. So <laughs> I look at it and I say, it, once a year, if you're an average guy, it's worth it. Once a year, get down there if you can afford it. But for the average Joe, it's not fair, it's not fun, but it's the cost of doing business, man. It's the cost of doing business with a good football team. Could you imagine what the prices are going to be if the Lions win two, three playoff games, get to the Super Bowl? Man, Mrs. Mrs. Sheila is going to be raking in the dough. That's how it goes. And, you know, it's it's unfortunate. The average Joe does get cut out, but it's not worth it. Do you think that if you, if you were a season ticket holder, let's just uh, put it this way, because if you were a season ticket holder and you, you were there for like the last five years, you saw some of the struggles with Patricia, you held on through COVID, you, you trust Dan Campbell, you love it, it was 1500 now they tell you it's twenty eight. Are you doing it? Would you? Would you? Would you reinvest with that? Number? I wouldn't be able to. Do the it. average that would, sent to us the message. I mean, as much as I would podcast, want to, I wouldn't be able to afford that. Fifteen. Yeah. It just yeah. Fifty percent increase like, is, is just. It, this some, is the thing. It, it's not like we we live in in this world where yeah, everything's kind of staying stagnant. Everything is going up. Everything. Right? Like everything. Gas yeah. Is ridiculous. Groceries are ridiculous. Like like across the board, everything is going up. So then when your when your fun expenses basically double i don't know how you can afford to do something like that if you're going to buy those tickets i feel like you have to do it with a with a friend or with a partner yeah where you guys are willing to split whatever the cost is like i'll take half you take half we'll figure out the games you know you'd have to do something like that where where you guys go in, in on it together because otherwise i don't know how you can afford to to make those types of payments because look i'll be honest with you I just got my annual raise and my company gave me a 2% annual raise. I was pretty pissed when I got my annual raise. I was like, well, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? It's not a lot of money. Like there, there's like inflation, inflation itself goes up yeah. anywhere from, from five to, to almost 7%. Whew. So you're, you're giving me 2%. Like how am I supposed to make ends meet? Basically what you're telling me is what I earned last year. I'm earning less now this year yeah. compared to what I earned last year because of inflation. Right. And you just don't care. It's really unfortunate. It's really upsetting. So I, I don't know how people can can afford to do these types of things when, you know, and, and I don't know if, again, this is a thing. This is big business. Big business doesn't care about the little man. Big right. business cares about packing the stadium and, and having their seats full and, 
And at whatever cost it is, this is how we're going to get it done. So I think that the people who basically control the market, control control the pricing for the Lions, sit there and, and check the things where – like StubHub, check uh, – SeatGeek and, and see the aftermarket ticket prices and they see how those are, are flying off the shelves yeah. and they see how they have a, a packed stadium. So what do they want to do? Well, that means that we can charge more because there's more right. demand. So it's trying to find that supply and demand and, and that's what they're going for. So, I mean, if they can charge it, people are willing to pay for it. That's what you'll be getting. But the common man won't be able to attend those things. I basically try to attend uh, one Lions game, one Red Wings game. I don't mess with the Pistons because they're disgusting, and um, I might go to a I might go to a Tigers game every year. Just try to go to at least one, and that's all I can afford. I, I I'm I'm priced out, you know. It's it's wild to look at it. Oh man, it's just crazy with the NFL, big business, wild business, and uh, it's just interesting to see how the fans are going to react, and it'll be interesting to see uh, how the Lions you know handle it and seeing the response. Do they just go with it? Do they uh, do something special more for the fans? And it, it'll be it'll be curious to see. I mean, can, can you do something better than getting like a guy like Jack Harlow and his stupid little igloo for Thanksgiving Day? Can you yeah. do something like like I mean, shit? You can roll Dolly Parton's ninety year old ass out there. She still looks fantastic. Roll her out there and let her perform because that was a much better entertaining uh, uh, halftime show instead of what she gave us for for Thanksgiving. You know, can you do something like that instead? Hey, fans, you, you, you give us trash yeah i'll say this here's the thing the the detroit halftime show for thanksgiving is always so damn embarrassing i always like all right well how are they going to screw this one up and they just they always kind of end up mucking it up it's funny to me right no no if you ever go out to training camp i mean thank you for the sunglasses thank you for the little knickknacks and the beads but could you kind of step it up maybe they're they got to save up and pay for a new new training camp facility out in macomb that'd be great you know, okay, if they're gonna open up right a new, by your house, yeah, a new four hundred million dollar training facility by by Macomb Township, I'll be like, you know what, raise another fifty percent. That's fine. <laughs> Let the corporate bigwigs take over. But uh, yeah, it, they, listen, it's a business, and that's how it is. It's tough to keep up, and and honestly, because yeah, for sports fans, it's crazy. Because if you love sports, you can't get in the building for less than three hundred bucks nowadays and enjoy yourself. It's uh, it's not worth it. Like I said, it's always worth it to get your friends together. Uh, kick in a six pack, have, have your own bathroom, laugh, scream your head off, have no worries. And you don't have to brave the elements you, and, and, and you don't got to pay. Look, you, you, you think the parking guys are going to be like, Oh, let's leave the rates at 70 bucks. No, they're going to be, it's going to be hundred dollar parking next year. Yep. Hundred dollar parking next to Ford field. So everybody's getting a taste of the action and it, it's just unfortunate for the common guy. And, uh, it'll be interesting to see the reaction moving forward and everything like that. But let's end on a positive note. Good. Speaking of getting that action. Getting that transfer portal action, baby. Yeah, transfer portal action. Got the best quarterback in the portal for Michigan State. Look, I don't claim to know anything about, you know, the quarterbacks out west. I know that he's got mobility, strong arm, and I'll say this. He knows the system. He's going to hit the ground running. I think it's great that Michigan State, obviously, they set up their guys, and Jonathan Smith knew coming in that he was going to find somebody that he knew that he was close with, and the opportunity that he got in regards to landing the best quarterback in the transfer portal. Uh, Aiden Childs, I think, is going to hit the ground running. And I love what I'm seeing from Michigan State in terms of recruiting. I think that Smith uh, is doing a wonderful job in regards to upgrading the talent. The linebacker from Wisconsin I thought was solid. You're getting opportunities to put together a roster that's at least better than what they had this year in 23. Well, so what's that's, it that's feel a good start. like having a, a head coach who is serious about his job? Serious business. It's not serious about jacking off in front of a <laughs> camera phone. Yeah, and much better to see the head coach recruiting and getting in the portal and handling his business and getting people that will Well, Mel Tucker was trying to get in a portal. Yeah, <laughs> trying to get in the holes, right? <laughs> that's right, <laughs> trying to fill them up. Yeah, no, I'm happy. It's it's a good It's a good sign. It's a good situation. Um, real fast with you, do you care about the the ex Michigan staffer, ex coach going over to Alabama? I thought it was a little interesting. Alabama pulling, playing some games here. Yeah, I I thought that was interesting. I was like, huh, huh. okay, and it, a little bit of gamesmanship there. Uh, leave it to Nick Saban to 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 do what Nick Saban does. Um, I don't necessarily like it, but it's it's what it is. Does it surprise me? No. I mean, Nick Saban's going to do whatever he's got to do. He's on a quest for another one. So it, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, I, I think my my biggest letdown, my biggest upset, pet peeve was uh, the UCLA 
quarterback going to Oregon. He's a Michigan Michigan guy. I believe he had connections and he wanted to go to Michigan State. Uh, so it didn't really work out. I know Michigan was involved with trying to get him here. Obviously, ends up going to Oregon. That's uh, much better for, for Oregon. And look, I think Oregon's a hell of a program, so it kind of makes sense. But I would love for him to come to Michigan. That yeah. That's probably got me a little bit more annoyed than than the ex-staff for going to Alabama. Absolutely. Good stuff. Our time is up. Our hour is up. Thank you guys so much for supporting the project. We appreciate it. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at AdamRSGROZ. Subscribe, baby. Do your thing. Everybody, go to your favorite place you listen to podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. Type in Detroit Sports Podcast, and our content will find you. Once you hit that subscribe button, got great content covering Michigan, professional wrestling, WWE, AEW, everything in the world of Detroit sports, Pistons, Red Wings, Tigers, and the Detroit Lions. Got it all covered on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Podcasting time is now over because I can't wait to break down maybe the NFC North division winners, the Detroit Lions, next week on the latest episode of Doc and Jock.